One bright day in the spring of 2001, a woman is in the kitchen of her modest home in the Dale End Road of the Derbyshire village of Hilton when her doorbell rings. She is expecting visitors. They are the police officers and are well known to her. They are not visiting her on official business. One of the officers, who has recently been working as a detective inspector in the elite national crime squad, the NCS, is the woman's lover. Two colleagues from the NCS's Nottingham branch are with him. The scene is an unusual one. Cocaine is being chopped on the kitchen work surface and in the corner of the room, another man is smoking a cannabis joint. He is a prisoner on day release from HMP Ashwell, serving six and a half years for drug offences. The detective inspector talks to the prisoner as a long-standing friend. He knows him well. After all, he had personally busted him a few years earlier. The DI agrees with his mistress about who should feed her cat and who should chop up the lines of cocaine. Unknown to any of them, a covert investigation into their activities, codenamed Operation Lancelot, was underway. For six months, it had been following the DI's every move, even tracking his car via the Blue Road camera networks across Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. A few months earlier, in the dead of the night, officers from Merseyside Police had broken into a woman's house in the Dale End Road and hidden a listening device and a video camera somewhere in the kitchen area. This, it had been reasoned, was where most of the conversations would take place. Hours of footage turned out to be useless because the household cat's favourite sleeping spot was in front of the pinhole camera lens. But now Merseyside team were rubbing their hands together in glee. They were in business. The target is David Redfern, a highly respected Derbyshire officer of 18 years with a wall cabinet full of commendations who until recently had been the secondment to the NCS. There is also likely to be collateral damage to those who associate with him. Alongside him is Derbyshire colleague Detective Sergeant Mark Jenninson and his Nottinghamshire colleague Detective Constable Heather Charlie Bossart. The two other people in the house are Mr Redfern's 36 year old mistress Nicola Bladen and David Jones, the prisoner enjoying a day on release. Mr Redfern had collected Mr Jones earlier that day from prison and driven him to Mr Blowden's home. Mr Redfern would later say in his defence that he was trying to recruit Mr Jones as an informant. The cocaine goes down well. Investigator hear the sniffs of the participants nostrils as he inhaled it. The blonde haired DC bosser is heard saying that last time she took it she had gone shopping and it was so good it felt like she was dancing in Ikea. Mr Redfern advises Mark Jenison how to avoid detection if caught with a wrap of cocaine. What you do is you hand in a wrap of Charlie to the exhibits desk and say that you took it off an informant. Then if you happen to get pulled on something and you have a wrap on you, you can say this is some stuff I took off an informant. It's not mine, I was just going to hand it in. Just check, I did the same thing a while back. Honestly, it works every time. Mr. Jenison is restless. His kids are waiting for him in a car outside and he has to make tracks. The group slowly dissolves. Mr. Redfern has some work to do. He needs to see a potential informant in Nottingham. He was sent back to his home force in Derbyshire the previous year because of something to do with his informant handling. Was it something to do with trying to register one of his informants in Nottingham, he wonders. He is not sure, but he is sure that it's not due to his coke snorting antics. After all, no one knows about that except those in the room with him and he always has an explanation if he gets caught with anything. He must have felt very safe, maybe because he knew other officers who got up to no good. Who knows if the sergeant smokes a bit of cannabis now and again, or a constable sells knockoff clothing to some of his mates. And no one cares much if a detective turns a blind eye to the class A drug dealing that his informant is up to. By the end of April 2001, a covert team of Merseyside officers working the Operation Lancelot had compiled enough damning evidence against the three officers and their drug taking friends to make their move. All the material from the covert surveillance was being overseen by a management board from the National Crime Squad. It was a situation without parallel, underlining the seriousness of the situation. The material on the books was only known to them and those compiling the transcripts. The sensitivity of the material discussed on the books would present hurdles to negotiate once the case came to court. On Saturday the 28th of April, a series of dawn raids at their homes, Mr Redfern, Miss Jenison and Mr Bozart 
were arrested along with seven other people, including two further Derbyshire officers for alleged drug offences. The officers at the NCS in Nottingham and Balper were in turmoil. In addition, two of the NCS's senior officers in the region, top boss detective Chief Inspector Roger Hardy, senior manager detective inspector Ian Tucker and detective constable David Branston were sent back to their home force. Derbyshire, in a move unconnected to the drug charges, though arising from intelligence received as a result from Operation Lancelot. It was later revealed in the High Court that they were told that the director of the NCS, Bill Hughes, had lost confidence in the marginal abilities of senior managers and questions had been raised about the informant handling going on in this NCS unit. D.I. Tucker, who faced no disciplinary charges, later challenged the decision against him in the High Court. He had never been told what he was supposed to have done wrong, but such was the secrecy surrounding the case that even the High Court was unable to make a ruling to hear the case by a judicial review. It was clear that Operation Lancelot had uncovered something more sinister than just drug taking, but taking it further would be a legal minefield, opening up the possibility that previous convictions handled by the NCS unit in Balper could be challenged by jailed villains. This was an unprecedented moment in terms of policing at this level, a deeply embarrassing one for both Bill Hughes and the then Home Secretary Drax Straw, who had set up an elite national crime squad in 1998 to replace the old regional crime squads. NCS were often perceived by both themselves and their colleagues in more mundane police posts as the cream of the cream. Their role was to work in small teams of between 6 and 10 officers, targeting the biggest criminals who were often involved in large-scale drug importation and organised crime. By April 2001, some 61 detectives from a total of 1,400 had been expelled from the NCS and sent back to their home forces. The scandal at the East Midlands units, however, was another dimension. This was to be the first time that officers from one of the most elite police units in the country would be arrested and convicted. The NCS, which would later be swept under the umbrella of the newly formed Serious Organised Crime Agency, was only three years old and some of its officers could not be trusted. By the time the case went to trial at Northampton Crown Court in November of 2002, Mr Redfern, 42, and Mr Bossart, 40, knew the game was up and pleaded guilty to possession of a Class A drug. In Mr Redfern's case, the charges also included possession of intent to supply and perverting the course of justice. Mr Jenison, who was 41, denied supplying and possession of drugs but was convicted. Mr Redfern was jailed for three years and nine months and Mr Bladden for two years. Both sentences were reduced upon appeal on the grounds that the judge had been manifestly excessive in his sentencing. Mr Jenison was jailed for a year. Miss Bossart received 100 hours of community service for possessing cocaine. The officers were also dismissed from the Derbyshire force. Road coppers are a blight on any police force, but the repercussions when those involved are supposed to be part of an elite detective squad can undermine the public confidence on a national scale. As John Murphy, Assistant Chief Constable of Merseyside Police, pointed out to a conference of the Association of Police Officers in 2007, the police force is a reflection of the people who make up the society which we live in. Society has changed and so have the people that we recruit, he told a packed audience. Many of them have been involved in drug use. That involves purchasing substances and involves criminal relationships. One thing we have learned is that once you cross that Rubicon, there is no stepping back. Even before officers and police staff join the service, they can be compromised. This makes them vulnerable and this can result in the leakage of information and much worse. It is not of course restricted to new recruits. There are vast amounts of criminal money swirling around the streets and some of it will inevitably be used to try and seduce and compromise our staff. Criminal corruption is born out of poor culture, a culture where poor standards are tolerated. Almost every investigation we complete tells us the same thing. Opportunities to get rid of corrupt individuals have previously arisen when they have come to notice before for bad behaviour, often resulting in a discipline or even court. The nettle has never been grasped. People bending the rules to get the job done. We can all produce results if we play by different rules. It is tragic watching, as I have, good people getting sucked into criminal conspiracies because they are too weak to challenge the poor behaviour and consequently become increasingly compromised to the point where they can't intervene without incriminating themselves. Intelligence is power 
and people want the power that accesses our information and our intelligence gives them. We rely greatly on the public to provide information and intelligence that allows us to do our job. They provide it willingly, trusting us to protect it and use it appropriately. We are not villagers. Our lifeblood will dry up and that our hard-won trust to the public confidence will one day be lost. By the late 1990s, senior police officers in Nottinghamshire suspected that there were a number of detectives involved in unhealthy relationships with criminals born out of the less than rigorous informant system. Indeed, the whole system was flawed. On paper, the role of an informant and the role of the police or agency involved, it should be very clear. The informant is usually an offender himself or herself and in return for a favourable outlook on an offence he or she may have committed and sometimes a fee, they will give and pass on information that will prevent crimes being committed by others at a greater magnitude. But the simplicity of it all made it right for abuse on both sides, particularly when the informant started to control the handler. The trouble would start when the informant would begin to use the handler to get away with their own crime, to suck information from the handler and to plant information into the system which, whilst looking good for the handler, would also help the informant carry out with their illegal activity. One detective who had two particular informants in Nottingham, who were used to great effect, at least so far as getting a result, was concerned. I knew the history of both informants. One was a young black man who was a prolific drug dealer. So prolific, in fact, he was dealing large amounts of cocaine to two premiership footballers during the mid-late 1990s. This young man, who I should call Norbit, was willing to do anything to take out rival dealers in the city. On one occasion, there was to be a coke bust on a dealer who was hiding his double life as a takeaway owner in Nottingham city centre. Norbit had told the police about the man and dutifully agreed to go to him and see whether the gear was still there so they could carry out the raid. He was only supposed to do a reconnaissance to see whether the target had anything at the premises, recounted the detective. He came out as planned and gave us the signal to go in as it was a goer. Sure enough, the gear was there, several thousand pounds worth, but a bit less than there should have been. What Norbert had done was take a large amount off the bloke on tick to be paid for later, and then left him to be busted. He knew that the guy was probably going to go straight to prison, and that there was no way he was going to be able to pay up. Norbert got paid handsomely for the information that he gave us. He was a winner on both counts. Another informant was a heroin dealer who we shall call Pamela. She was another prolific offender who lived with a pimp around a number of prostitutes in the city. She provided good information about the movement of heroin around St. Anne's estate. She got paid thousands of pounds for her information, but was actually passing on the details of large-scale dealers she herself was buying from and also the details of her own competitors. In one year alone, she had salted away £100,000 from her trade in heroin, selling it at £1,000 per ounce. Pamela had security cameras on her door and, in effect, her own protection. Police let her deal as long as she came up with the results. That carried on until she did get busted for heroin and couldn't argue her way out of it. Results of this kind were clearly achieved, but this was tainted by the fact that the information was being supplied in order to make the informant's drug dealing activities profitable and eliminate her competition. The Nottinghamshire Police Department, which dealt with corruption, had been renamed the Professional Standards Unit, otherwise known as PSU, in 2001. It was headed up by Superintendent Michael Layton, who had been one of the detectives leading the 1993 Eaton Green investigation when he was a detective inspector. He took the task of investigating fellow officers with zeal, so much so that he sometimes attracted criticism from peers. He felt that his anti-corruption specialists were targeting the wrong people. Ruthless was though, the very characteristic needed to bring down corrupt officers, who, by the very nature of their work, knew how to cover their tracks and which methods that PSU might use against them. Nevertheless, the determination of the PSU to nail a corrupt officer could often lead to blind spots and chasing red herrings. This was just what occurred in the early part of 2002 when a police officer who was suspected of corruption came under the PSU's spotlight. This man was a respected detective constable who specialised in handling informants and in undercover and surveillance work. He knew all the main players in Greater Nottingham and also knew the drugs trade inside out. He got excellent results, albeit by walking a very fine line. You don't get results by sitting in your office behind a computer. But by 2001, the PSU had drawn up a list of officers who they believed fulfilled the criteria 
likely to make them corrupt. And this officer was one they were going to take a closer look at. He ticked some of the right boxes. He was old school. He had been doing the same kind of job for more than a decade. And he also had a large number of informants. He also enjoyed getting his hands dirty. He didn't like paperwork and he hated being stuck in the office. On the 9th of December, an incident occurred which had major consequences. The detective constable had been involved in an investigation into the shooting at CJ's Bakery on Alpherton Road in Radford. A man had been shot in the groin during a black on black disrespect argument. The suspect, Christopher Prince Llewellyn, had been arrested during a police chase and a firearm believed to be linked to him was booked into the Carlton Police Station storeroom where exhibits are securely kept and locked until they are needed for court. But when Mr Llewellyn's defence team asked to see the firearm, it could not be found. Mr Llewellyn's defence team, sensing something was up, or perhaps having been tipped off, although the case was not ready for trial, the judge was not happy about the situation and was demanding answers. The weapon had been placed in the store by the detective constable some weeks earlier and now he was frenetically trying to figure out where it had gone. He spoke to everybody who could have come into contact with it. There was no doubt that it had gone into the secure store. The supervisor responsible for the storeroom also remembered the detective booking in the weapon because it wasn't a run of the mill item. Yet a series of searches at various police locations all proved fruitless. The detective constable along with the exhibits officer responsible for logging in the item was served with a disciplinary notice for property issues. But while the exhibits officer carried out his job as normal, the detective constable was told he would have to be put on restricted duties and moved back to the police station in the sticks until the matter could be resolved. By the time the CJ's bakery case had come up for trial in March 2002, the gun had mysteriously turned up again in the very store cupboard which it had previously been searched from top to bottom several times. The detective constable was understandably relieved, but also bemused. Weeks and then months passed, during which time Christopher Llewellyn was found not guilty of attempted murder and possession of a firearm but the officer was still under the PSU suspicion. On the 8th of November 2002, he received a call telling him to go see his boss in the office for a chat about informants. When he arrived, his boss, Detective Superintendent Michael Ward, was standing next to Superintendent Michael Layton and another officer, Chief Inspector Vince Terrace from the PSU. They informed the detective that he was under arrest on suspicion of malfeasance in a public office. In short, he was being done for corruption. He was ushered to a police car by two more senior officers who had been waiting to take him to Workstock Police Station. They had even tried to handcuff him before he got into the car, but he refused to be humiliated in front of his fellow officers as they relented. The detective constable could not believe what was happening. He felt the PSU officers were deliberately trying to humiliate him. However, it soon became clear that the PSU had been running a fine-tuned comb through his entire life. Such was the depth of the investigation that they had accessed his bank records and telephone calls. He had clearly been the target of a long and protracted inquiry, which raised questions about his informant handling. As he languished in the cell for several hours, his home was searched without anyone being present. Dumbfounded, he then faced the barrage of questions, accumulating in the assertion from the interviewing officers that he was a corrupt and dishonest officer. With the interrogation over, he was allowed to go, but not before being told that he was suspended from duty pending further inquiries. The detective constable knew from the line of questioning that the PSU had spent the preceding months tracing and interviewing all his informants. It seemed to him nothing more than a fishing expedition, and as far as he was concerned, the PSU hadn't hooked any fish at all. For a while, the PSU officers had almost felt the same way, until they had approached one of the detective's most prolific informants, whose information led to dozens of arrests. This informant, a heroin dealer, claimed among other things that the officer had pocketed money which should have been paid to her. That specific allegation had been the grounds for arresting the detective constable he was to learn later on. However, there was no prima facie evidence that could be used to make the allegation look true. The informant was somebody who had recently been to jail for dealing large amounts of heroin. Not the most credible witness by any rule of thumb, but particularly 
when it came to the case of an officer's word against hers. Still, despite the protestations of the detective's solicitor, it would take another year before the officer heard that the Crown Prosecution Service was not going to recommend any charges against him. Even after that, he was kept suspended from duty, pending further investigations into possible misconduct issues. It was not until January 2004 that he was told that he would not only face any criminal charges, but he would not also face any disciplinary charges. He was free to return to work. The PSU had spent more than two years turning his life inside out and it nearly broke him. He had his colleagues pointing the finger at him and the stress of a two year investigation had nearly ended his marriage. He took the option of retiring on ill health grounds. Not only had the force lost the excellent officer who had given his life to them for the past 26 years, the PSU had also targeted the wrong man. A few miles from the major crime unit office in Sentry House on Carlton Hill, where the officer had been based. Another man was busy helping out the Bestwood cartel. He was their clear skin. The shop assistant turned trainee detective Charles Fletcher had been on the job since autumn 2000 and was based at the busy Radford Road police station. In the two years the PSU had been investigating their red herring, there had been a real double agent operating right under their radar. Mr. Fletcher had already been able to pass on a wealth of useful information to Colin Gunn and his associate. It would be 2003 before an operation was mounted to look at the information going to Colin Gunn via corrupt officers. Operation Salt was to be one of the most secret investigations mounted by Nottinghamshire police. In the meantime, a war was about to be unleashed on the city streets. By the beginning of 2001, Colin Gunn and his associates had assembled a band of middle tier dealers to supply the markets at St Anne's, Meadows and Radford's and the areas of nearby Derby. Two of these major dealers, Dion Griffin and Carl Rose, were about to be targeted by Nottinghamshire's police's major crime unit. Intelligence suggested that Mr Griffin and Mr Rose were dealing with a Derby heroin dealer named Daniel Walsh and that Colin and David Gunn, David was now out of prison, were using Mr Griffin to supply Nottingham's estates outside of Bestwood and even to inmates within the prison system. Intelligence revealed that several prison officers from different prisons had been corrupted by the Bestwood cartel and were allowing heroin to get inside. Operation Opal was set up specifically to target middle tier dealers used by the cartel. Bugs were placed in Mr Griffin's high car and at 30 year old Mr Rose's home in Aspley, Nottingham. Mobile phones were also bugged. The material gained from bugs in the car's headrest revealed 28 year old Mr Griffin to have a very big ego. He had bragged to customers sitting in the car. I'm the only one who can get away with dealing in St Anne's, the Meadows and Radford. No one else has got the contacts to get past the territorial problems. I can even get stuff into prison. I'm the top man. During the weeks of surveillance, Officers discovered that Mr Griffin was overseeing up to 10 kilos of heroin per week as well as large amounts of cocaine and amphetamines. The heroin was coming in from the Bestwood cartel's links to Liverpool's underworld. The cocaine however, at wholesale price, was less than 25% pure. By the time it had been cut up to go out onto the streets, it would be less than 5% cocaine in the grams people were buying for 30 to 50 pounds. It was cut with all sorts of other agents. Such was the demand for cocaine poor quality or not, that people were still buying it. Having gathered a large amount of information on the Bestwood cartel and what it was up to, in the autumn of 2001, police decided to arrest Mr Griffin and Mr Rose. They watched Mr Griffin meeting two men in Radford and new drugs had been arrived at the premises. On the 18th of October, at around 12.30pm, the Operation Opal team burst into the property on Croydon Road. Mr Griffin and others tried to escape for a window, but they were not quick enough. Police found half a kilo of cocaine and more than £10,000 in cash. At another bust in Derby, police found more than £650,000 worth of cocaine and heroin belonging to Mr Griffin and another £7,000 worth of amphetamines. Mr Griffin was buying his heroin at £18,000 per kilo and selling it on at £21,000. Police estimated that his profits in the limited time that they had looked at him were in the region of £100,000. He had properties in Ruddington in Nottinghamshire and Baymount Lees in Leicestershire. Next they arrested Mr Rose who had made at least £40,000 in just a few months. They found live ammunition and a Brocock gun which had been converted to fire live rounds. Mr Griffin was jailed for five years at Derby Crown Court in December of 2002 and Mr Rose was jailed for eight years after initially pleading not guilty. Daniel Walsh, who had been supplied with heroin by both Mr Rose and Mr Griffin after the police had disrupted his own heroin network, 
was jailed for eight years. When he eventually came out of prison, Mr. Griffin, who had more ego than sense, would make more headlines after filming himself on his mobile phone camera, driving one-handed at speeds of excess of 130 miles per hour in his Mini Cooper. He planned to put the film onto a website, but police found the footage after he was arrested in connection with a £14 million heroin haul in Ruddington in October of 2007. They were astonished by the footage and chose to prosecute him. Mr Griffin, much to his dislike, was sent back to prison for eight months in May 2008. The taking down of Mr Griffin and Mr Rose had been only the first phase of Operation Opal and the detectives on the ground were eager to begin the second phase, which could see Colin and David Gunn being targeted. In autumn 2001, over beers in Carlton Place Station Bar, some of the team discussed how long it would take to get into the heart of the gun's operation. The general consensus was that, with the infrastructure for the police investigation in place, including bugs and informants, it could be done in less than five months. It was a goer, and better still, they had the ear and support of the head of CID, Detective Chief Superintendent Phil Davis, who had decided that the Gun Brothers were a threat that needed dealing with before they became any bigger. Sometime during the mid-1990s, DCS Davies, along with the previous head of CID, Peter Coles, whom he succeeded in 1996, drew up a list of significant organised crime targets. The major crime unit was the jewel of the Nottinghamshire Police Crown and had a track record which was the envy of many. So successful had it been in taking down major targets that a number of police forces had used it as a blueprint. The list of targets Phil Davis and Peter Coles drew up was based around the intelligence they had on which villains were the biggest threat at the time. These included Wayne and Dean Hardy, David Francis, Robert Briggs Price, and Colin and David Gunn. Full of expectation that Opal would carry on to its conclusion, the team had a bombshell dropped on it. The top corridor at Nottinghamshire Police had decided that it was time to wrap up the operation. Stephen Green joined Nottinghamshire Police as Chief Constable in June of the year 2000 from Staffordshire. He was a surprise choice for many and a departure from the old school, detective influenced style of his predecessor, Colin Bailey. He told his officers that there would be a radical change at the force. That was what the Home Office wanted. Mr Green believed Nottinghamshire Police as an institution was riddled with problems. He was going to stamp his authority on the force and breathed 21st century change into the force. The Home Office was behind him. It specifically wanted to sort out the volume of crime and problems and the changes that were needed in the force to achieve that. The Doncaster-born Yorkshireman was 44, an ex-officer with the Royal Signal Corps. He had joined the police in 1978 and rapidly worked his way up. Crucially, however, he had never spent any significant period within a criminal investigation department, something his critics would later hold against him. In June 2000, he made the drive to Nottinghamshire Police Headquarters at Sherwood Lodge. He had already told the local media what he thought the priorities would be. I do not see my role in knots as making the police so specialist that they become totally remote from the public. Reducing crime has been a priority, no matter how hard it will be. He was taking over a force which had the third highest crime figures in the country and tackling this volume of crime would be one of the cornerstones of his approach. I am aware of the high crime rates and make no mistake, it's going to be a challenge. I need to understand why it is so high before taking a look at how it can be reduced. But reducing it will be my priority. I want it known throughout the force that I am coming to the table wanting to know how our service is being delivered and what effect it is having. Public often look for words of reassurance from the police and that is fine but the best way of reassuring and making them feel safe is to reduce crime in the local area it's the same with crime detection i put far more priority on crime reduction than just solving crime detection is just one of the many ways of reducing crime which is what we all want mr green's priorities soon became very apparent over the next few months the drug squad was disbanded the major crime unit, perceived by many officers as the jewel in the crown, was halved in manpower and detectives were sent back to their divisions. Murder cases would now be dealt with by those divisions instead. Mr Green spoke passionately about speed cameras during the early part of his tenure and in 2001, Nottinghamshire became the pilot from eight police forces, allowed to keep money gained from speeding fines to be used to buy high-tech digital cameras which would catch three drivers every second. As he stated in the regional BBC television interview, looking back on his arrival in Nottinghamshire, the force desperately needed to be modernised, he said. It has got out of date 
in a whole range of ways. We had to address the volume of crime. Burglaries, car crimes, robberies, they were all going up and they needed to come down. It would have been impossible to say to the home office and indeed the public, just forget about that because we've got something more important to do. But by 2002, the battle against crime in Nottinghamshire was becoming affected by poor management of resources. Scene of the crime officers were sent out to only 7 out of 10 house burglaries and 2 out of 10 car crime cases, well below the national average. It meant these crimes were now less likely to be solved and would trigger a higher insurance premium for householders, especially in the NG postcodes. For at least two months, thousands of people trying to contact the police to report crime over the call system were greeted with a message telling them to call back later. In June 2002 alone, the country's police failed to deal with 14,000 phone calls, including 2,500 emergency calls. It was total chaos, one senior officer said. We have been undergoing massive reorganisation and it just wasn't working. There were people who just didn't know what was going on and what they were going to do anymore. There were times when two different teams of officers would be sent out to a job and then they arrived to find that neither knew what the other one was covering. If you got burgled, you would be lucky to get an SOCO, Seam of the Crime Officer, out at all, let alone within 48 hours of the crime actually being committed. Added to that, lots of areas had lost their beat officers, some of whom had been on there for years and knew the community very well. The message it sent to the public in Nottingham was that, that we were afraid to do the foot patrols in difficult areas and we didn't give a toss anymore, so much so that we couldn't even be bothered to answer the phone. We were only worried about the targets we were Chasing. The charges meant that the Operation Opal drug investigation would not be progressing any further than the charges laid against Dion Griffin and Carl Rose. We couldn't understand it, one officer said. We had been geared up to take on the Gun Brothers for a long time that you could have used to measure up these things and it seemed the perfect opportunity. Everything was in place at the time so we could step up the gear. There was no clear explanation other than the resources required did not merit the worth of the job. The home office are on our back and we have got to spend the money in other areas so we hit our targets. It was a missed opportunity. With hindsight of course, it's clear that the top brass would have done things very differently had they known what would happen over the next few years. The major crime unit had successfully wrapped up on Operation Long Island which had led to the arrest of Robert's Big Price. But the view from the top corridor was that the Long Island was to be the last major investigation of that type for the foreseeable future. The cost of such operations was cited as a major factor in the decision, backing a view now held by the Chief Constable and several others at senior command level. It chimed well with the Home Office's obsession with targets and in a climate in which the league table positions meant everything. It was a decision that the new Chief Constable Steve Green had wholly endorsed when he arrived in the June of 2000. Within months of his arrival, he had brought in a few raft of new measures, many of which did not strike a chord with either the public or junior ranks in the police force. There was a view in the top corridor that we would be fritting away valuable resources on targeting individuals. Taking out one or two top villains was not going to affect that many people said another officer involved in Operation Opal. You had to measure up the impact of taking out the top man had on other criminals and the reputation you reap from that. The feeling was that those vulnerable resources would become more wisely used to tackle volume crime. Problems such as street robberies, burglaries and car crime. But if you look at what's causing all the volume crime, while well, it's the gangsters, you need to take a holistic view on things if you're going to solve the problem. And that means taking out the top players. Yes, they will inevitably get replaced by others once you have taken them out. But by disrupting them continually, you don't give them a chance to settle and dominate the situation. We went from going from having a position of a respected reputation in the 1990s for taking out top criminals to a poor reputation where the major cry lean criminals from outside the city thought Nottinghamshire was a soft touch in 2001 and 2002. There were some strange decisions being made around that time which basically came about as a result of the new chief constable wanting to put his stamp on things. So you had the disbandment of the drug squad, the major crime unit's resources were being halved and on top of that all some of us were aware that there was a storm about to hit us in the form of gun crime. The problem was that some of the decision makers 
were not up to the challenges which they were being faced with. Detectives from the major crime unit were being sent back to their geographical divisions where they seemed to be at the view that the specialist units were elitist. Well, I suppose you could say they were in a way, because they had expert knowledge, but that is the way to meet the challenges facing you. It meant that when decisions were made to draw detectives from whoever was available in the divisions, instead of from a pool of experts within the major crime unit, senior officers ended up on a hodgepodge team which was not unified in the way that they had been before. Sometimes the teams contained detectives who were not even on speaking terms. Sometimes we had divisional superintendents who wouldn't let people out on the major jobs because they had wanted to keep their own staffing levels to optimum levels for the senior detective who was involved in Opal. So senior investigating officers were often being left understaffed, scrapping around for detectives and without the expertise they needed or knitted team that they also needed. As a result of the specialist units being disbanded, we were losing large rafts of our intelligence system. The disbanding of the drug squad had a major knock-on effect. There were areas where we simply didn't know what was going on anymore. The drug squad had been very good at giving us an early warning system. It told us who was doing what and who the new players were coming through. We had seen firearms used, but mainly connected with armed robberies or being discharged into cars or buildings as a scare tactic. By 2000, we started to see firearms being used regularly on persons, and this was every day by very young street dealers who were shooting each other, particularly in terms of young black men shooting other young black men. All of it was connected to illegal drugs markets. That was, of course, where we took our eye off the ball. We were concentrating so much on dealing with the black on black shootings that we ignored what was going on in Bestwood and what Colin and David Gunn were actually up to until it was too late as far as people were concerned. Had Opal been taken into its logical conclusion, many of the people who were murdered would still be alive today. The former CID boss, Peter Cole said, there is a school of thought not mine I have to say, which would say if you don't have a drug squad, by that I mean an institution which is recording activity in the illegal drugs market, but you can almost say that you don't have a drugs problem. If you don't have something dedicated to tackling a problem, you can never measure anything about it and know just how bad the problem actually is that faces you. As it would later prove, the decision to bring Opal to a shuddering halt was a more than missed opportunity. It was a decision which was to have very tragic consequences. By the time the Gun Brothers were targeted again, they had grown much stronger and much more powerful. A new operation would have to start from scratch and the force would have to dig deeper to find the resources needed for a successful outcome than they would have in 2001. It would be another two years before it got underway and would be called Operation Starburst, a multifaceted top secret project which would be likened to a Russian doll containing operations within operations and which would at last attack the very core of organised crime. In the meantime, the city's reputation would be shot literally to pieces.